Hello everyone and welcome to the MTAP for the first semester in clinical parasitology. And we're still under the phylum Sarcoma stegophora, but in this video we'll be focusing our attention to the class Zooma stegophora or what we call the flagellates. So we'll start our discussion with the intestinal and atrial flagellates. Here are the general characteristics of your flagellates. So your flagellates are types of protozoans that possess a whip-like locomotory organelle called your flagella. So together with your axonyms and axostyle, this helps or this structure helps the parasite to move from one place to another, specifically those pathogenic ones. Kinetoplast, on the other hand, is also a structure which uh, helps in the energizing of the parasite. So this is a neuromotor apparatus, much like the brain of humans. So the infective stage of this parasite is also cis. So this is the resistant stage of the parasite. And the trophozoite is the feeding and the motile stage of the parasite. So here are some of the anatomy of your flagellates. So for the trophozoite, uh, it contains a median or what we call the parabasal body which helps in metabolism, energy, and support. For the flagella, this is basically for motility. And for axoneme, this is also for motility and structural support of the parasite. Another one is your cystosome. So your cystostome is the term for the mouth, your costa, it connects the undulating membrane to the trophozoic body. So this is the green portion of the uh, picture here. No? But in micro, uh, under the microscope, this is not green. No? This is only to highlight the difference of the costa. Your uh, undulating membrane is for movement as well. In terms of the cis form, the presence of multiple nucleus are evident and also the parabasal bodies. So let's start with the first family of flagellates, and these are your intestinal flagellates. So we have three important parasites under this family, and only Gargelamblia is the pathogenic parasite. So let's start with the morphology of Gargelambia. So Gargelambia, in terms of their cyst, is a football-shaped cyst with two to four nuclei at one end. In terms of their axis style, this is, a, uh, this is centrally located with a retracted cytoplasm. In cases of formalized specimen, halo effect may be seen with uh, these types of parasites. So here is a sample picture of the cyst of Gargelambia. So the presence of 2 to 4 nuclei. So the more nuclei present on the cyst, the more mature it is. Also the centrally located axostyle and the retracted cytoplasm, just like here on this picture. In terms of their trophozoite, so this is the motile stage of the parasite. So we are expecting to observe the motility of this particular parasite, your Gargelambia. So these exhibit falling leaf motility or flip-flop motility, which later on we'll be showing you in a while. In terms of their shape, this is a pear shape or pyriform with four pairs of flagella. So the most diagnostic part of this uh, morphological stage or trophozoite stage is the presence of a large ventral sucking disc. So this is photognomic, which means that this is diagnostic and very, um, very unique to your trophozoite for Gargelambia. So the presence of this structure helps the Gargelambia to be photogenic. In terms of their nuclei, it contains two nuclei that are located uh, on top or anteriorly. Uh, some, ob uh, some textbook observe this as the old man with eyeglasses. Some say this is a monkey face and also contains various specific surface proteins. So let me show you a picture. So as you can see, here is on the left a picture of the structure of your trophozoid. So the presence of the flagella, the axostyle, the nuclei that are located anteriorly, and the median or parabasal bodies. So as you can see here on an actual stained slide, so it looks like an old man with uh, glasses.
So here is the falling leaf motility or the flip-flop motility for Gargelambia. So this is a diagnostic uh, findings for the presence of the parasite. So now let's move on to the morphology of the non-pathogenic intestinal flagellates. So the first one is chylomastic mesnili. In terms of the cyst forms, these are lemon-shaped or safety pin cysts with an anterior hyaline knob or a nipple-like hyaline knob. So here is a sample picture. So the presence also of the cystosome is already evident on the cyst forms. So this is the mouth of the particular parasite. A clear hyaline knob is posi pos uh, positioned anteriorly and the presence of a single nucleus with a blood-like or a central karyosome. For the trapezoid stage, in terms of their motility, this has a still and rotary motility and their textbook says that this particular uh, stage appears to be a shepherd's crook. This has a prominent cystosome and a spiral group. Here is the sample picture. So the presence of a spiral groove is unique to this parasite. Also take note of the cystosome with fibrils and flagella. For Diantamoeba fragilis, this has no cyst stage but only trophozoite. So for the trophozoite, this is amoeboid or stellate in appearance. That's why back then, this was formally classified as an abiba. It has four karyosome in total or in a single nucleus, and when exposed to water, this explode or disintegrate, causing Hackinson phenomenon. So here is a sample picture of the parasite. So um, the presence of two nucleus with at least four or more than four uh, karyosome present. Now let's move on to the life cycle of the three intestinal flagellate. So most of the flagellates are acquired by ingestion of contaminated food and water with the cysts. For chylomastic mesnili, cysts as well, but for diantamoeba fragilis, the trophozoite is the infective stage. This is concomitant with Ascaris. So when we say concomitant, this may be seen also with Ascaris and Enterobius species. Next, in terms of the habitat, so both Chylomastic mesnili and Diantamoeba fragilis inhabits the large intestine, while Gargelamblia in the small intestine. Again, for the infective stage and diagnostic stage, the infective stage for Gargelamblia and Chylomastic mesnili is the cyst, while for Diantamoeba is the trophozoite. So for the pathology of Gargelambia, this is what we call gargiasis, and it is associated with multiple common names of similar signs and symptoms. So we have gay bowel syndrome, lenning red curse or traveler's diarrhea, backpacker's diarrhea, and beaver fever. So the disease is initiated when trophozoites feed by attaching their sucking disc to the mucosa of the duodenum. So some may also infect other sites of the body such as the bile ducts and the gallbladder. So this causes villus flattening and creep hypertrophy within the area, specifically on intestinal cases on the uh, mucosa of the intestinal lining. In terms of the signs and symptoms, for acute infection, this is associated with diarrhea with increased production of gas, your flatus, with a rotten egg odor. While for chronic cases, patients suffering from severe cases of gargiasis produce light-colored stools with a high fat content that may be caused by the secretions produced by irritated mucosal lining. So this is associated with bloody diarrhea with increased greasy and frothy stool due to the presence of high fat content. So this is what we call steatorrhea. For the diagnosis of your intestinal flagellates, the specimen of choice is a stool sample to highlight the presence of your cyst forms for these particular parasites. For duodenal aspirate, this is helpful in extracting the trophozoite. So the method of choice for this duodenal aspiration is your enterotesting.
In terms of the method, direct antibody fluorescence is the gold standard for Gargelambia and the non-pathogenic ones. So your direct antibody fluorescence involves the application of antibody fluorophore conjugate molecules where a primary antibody, just like here on this picture, attaches to the antigen present on the patient sample. So these antibody fluorophore, uh, fluorophore conjugate target abnormal deposition of proteins in the patient sample. When exposed to light, the fluorophore present on the primary antibody emits its own frequency of light, which is seen in the microscope. So the particular staining pattern and the type of abnormal protein deposition, which is seen in the sample of the patient, help diagnose the disease. Other methods that we can use is antigen testing. So for the commensal or the non-pathogenic intestinal flagellates, your chylomastic mesnili and diantemiba fragilis, the stains that we can use is iron hematoxylin and trichrome, trichrome staining. Well, for the diagnostic method, aside from direct antibody fluorescence, RT-PCR is recommended. So now let's move on to the atrial flagellates. So these types of flagellate possess also a whip-like locomotor apparatus, which is your flagella. So special organs similar to your intestinal flagellate, such as sucking disc, axostyle, and undulating membrane have been developed to withstand the peristaltic action of the intestine. So these are so-called atrial because these are parasites that live in body cavities and urinary tract. So remember, for trichomonas species or the atrial flagellates, there is no C-stage present, so only trophozoid. So let's start first with the only pathogenic trichomonas species, and that would be your trichomonas vaginalis. So the habitat of this parasite is in the urogenital tract, and in terms of the size, this is the largest among the trichomonas species. In terms of their nucleus, it has an ovoidal nucleus, just like here on this picture. And in terms of their uh, undulating membrane, it is less than of the costa, just like here on this picture. So the most important one here is the presence of inclusion bodies in their axostyle. These are what we call your siderophil granules, just like here on this uh, picture. So in terms of the motility, this is the diagnostic characteristic of the parasite, Trichomonas vaginalis. This is the rapid, jerky, tumbling motility. So here is the rapid or corkscrew in some textbook or quivering motility of Trichomonas vaginalis. Next one is Trichomonas hominis. So this inhabits the intestinal tract of the patient. So usually the body cavity or the space between the intestinal tract or intestinal lumen of the patient is the habitat of this parasite. The size is medium with a ovoidal nucleus just like Trichomonas vaginalis but the most unique for this parasite is the undulating membrane which is as long as the costa. So same similar size of the costa and undulating membrane just like here on this picture. So there are no inclusion bodies present and the motility is wobbly or nervous. Next one is Trichomonas tenax. So this is the mouth Trichomonas and it inhabits the oral cavity of the infected host. So the size is the smallest among all your Trichomonas species and the nucleus is rounded. In terms of the undulating membrane, this is two-thirds of the costa, just like here on this picture. So it's almost as long as the costa. And in terms of the inclusion bodies, there are no present and the motility is not documented. For the pathology, this is also known as trichomoniasis or ping pong disease. So this is a sexually transmitted disease that is caused by trichomonas vaginalis. So this is so-called ping pong disease because of the persistent signs and symptoms felt by the patient. So for women, it is persistent vaginitis and for men, this is more common as persistent urethritis. So basically, for persistent vaginitis, this is found in infected women, which is characterized by foul smelling, greenish yellow liquid vaginal discharge. Usually, at the incubation for this particular disease is around 4 to 28 days. 
So this causes painful urination in the patient or what we call dysuria and inflammation and irritation to the vaginal canal. Strawberry cervix may also be uh, may also be observed for a patient with vaginitis as well. For male cases, asymptomatic cases of T. vaginalis is most frequently occur in men. So persistent or recurring urethritis is the condition that symptomatic men experience as a result of your T. vaginalis infection. Involvement of the seminal vesicles, higher parts of the urogenital tract, and prostate may occur in severe cases of infection. So signs and symptoms for male urethritis uh, includes severe infections of enlarged tender prostate, dysuria, nocturia, and epididymitis. So lastly, for the diagnosis of trichomonas vaginalis trophozoites, so these may be recovered using specimens such as urine, vaginal discharge, urethral discharge, and prostatic secretions. So the common procedure that we use is the saline preparation. So this is basically dropping a sample onto the glass slide and covering it with cover slip and view it under the microscope for the presence of the motile trophozoite. Again, the motility of trichomonas vaginalis is the rapid jerky motility. Although we can also use stained smear, saline preparation is the most preferred in most of the laboratory due to its uh, efficiency. So this is quick and fast, which is very helpful in viewing the motility of your trophozoites. Remember, trophozoites are very delicate morphological stages. That's why they, are, uh, they need to, to be viewed easily or uh, quickly. For the diagnostic procedures, the gold standard is considered to be the culture method. So this method can be used with vaginal swabs from men or from women rather, urethral swabs from men, urine sediment, and semen sediment. So this method requires incubation time and takes up to 3 days before a result is determined. So that ends our discussion for the intestinal and atrial flagellates. Thank you and good day.